In this video lesson, we're going to look at two topics in preparation for setting up the CI-CD pipeline. These are static code analysis and hardware in the loop testing. So here's an outline. I'll start with discussing static code analysis, which is a great tool to use in a CI-CD pipeline. Then I'll talk about hardware in the loop testing, which is the majority of this lesson. So the topics include uh, first some background, then the hardware and software setup used in this course and the connections, the MCU uh, application and what it does and how to test it, then a demo, then some prompts and followed by a short summary. So static code analysis means examining code without running it to, to understand it. And the fact that you don't run the code is why it's called static. Now, static code analysis uh, usually implies it's a tool doing it. If it were being done by a person, we'd probably call it a code review. Normally, uh, static code analysis is done to find potential bugs. So it's a good thing to run in a CI-CD pipeline so that it always runs when code changes. No one has to remember to do it. And you get quick uh, feedback with CI-CD um, so that hopefully the developer who put in the new code will see uh, any issues and, and it's fresh in their mind to fix them. So there are a lot of static code analysis tools. Some are free and some are licensed. I chose to use CPP Check because it has a free version, although it also has a uh, licensed version, which is presumably better. And it's easy to run from a script. In my work, I've also used a tool called Coverity, which is licensed. Uh, it did an incredible job at analyzing code and finding issues. So if you have good code that CPP check doesn't like, you can put the special comments in the code just before the problem, the problem in quotes, to keep CPP check from complaining. So as an example, the last course I did, uh, did had some fault handling code in it. And that code was doing some address uh, manipulations because it was looking into the stack trying to find some data. And CPP check didn't like what I was doing with those pointers. And I sort of understand why it didn't like it, but the code was actually fine. And so in that case, uh, you can put this comment, and here is the comment I used, telling it that in the following code, uh, don't do these compare pointer uh, checks because the code is fine. Now, I don't do this unless I have to. Sometimes you can see that it's complaining, it's being a little bit overly picky, but I'll change the code to, to make it happy. Now, for this course, I chose to only run CPP check on my code, not IDE provided code or any third party code. Uh, that's a decision that you have to make. Normally, if you run it on third party code, you're really only looking for some serious problems. Hopefully, you won't find them. Um, you probably aren't interested in fixing very minor, trivial things in third party code because. Uh, as far, in terms of software management, having to modify third-party code is, um, is sort of a burden. Now, in the pipeline, as we'll see later, I chose to continue going in the pipeline um, if CPP check detects a problem. In other words, I don't just stop right there. So, but I do mark the build as unstable so that someone looking at that uh, build can say, even though it made it all the way through, there's something not quite right about it. So now hardware in the loop testing. Now hardware in the loop testing is just one of several types of possibly automated testing. Perhaps the more common type of testing is unit test and maybe higher level tests based on some level of simulation of the product's hardware. Now these kind of tests involve writing additional software known as mocks or test harnesses and other names that is built with the product code to do the necessary simulation of hardware. And usually, but not always, this kind of testing runs on the build host, meaning that the product software being tested has to build and run on the build host. And often you'll see a, some if defs uh, to handle this special uh, build. So the emphasis of this course is hardware in the loop testing. 
But of course, you should incorporate as many kinds of testing as you can as these types listed here. The more, the better. The decision for you is where to spend the most time. So one thing I want to make clear is that even a small amount of hardware in the loop testing can be valuable. For example, just running the, or running the software, loading the software and running it and making sure it sort of comes up, perhaps using the console, is a uh, great test. And this is important for continuous delivery as it prevents what are sometimes called dead on arrival loads from being delivered. It is sort of embarrassing when someone comes to you and says, hey, those last five loads you built uh, won't even boot up. Now, I want to make a special point of verifying the build ID as part of your testing. And there is a story I heard recently on a uh, podcast that I could identify with about the Ring doorbell. If you aren't familiar, the Ring doorbell um, is an IoT device that has a little camera and a smartphone app, and there's various uh, use cases for it. Anyhow, they shipped their first product right before Christmas, and they immediately began to get complaints about the video quality. Um, and they were able to reproduce the problem in their lab. After some investigation, they found out that some software changes were made right before it shipped. And the testing was all okay, but it turns out there was some problem in their setup and they weren't actually testing the new software. So they ended up actually shipping software that was never tested at all. I have to say, after having spent uh, so much time in Embedded, I felt bad for the people involved. It must have been gut-wrenching when they discovered uh, what had happened. But on the bright side, they were lucky um, to find a way to fix the problem on the cloud side. And so it had sort of a happy ending. But if not for that, uh, the Ring doorbell might not ever have um, succeeded as a product. So here is a diagram of the setup for the hardware in the loop testing. Now this blue box represents the build server, which is your laptop. In the middle, we see this file called basehilt.py. This is the script for the hardware in the loop test, and you might recognize that it's written in Python. The script can either be run from the Jenkins pipeline or manually from the command line. Now the test script runs two programs called plink. We'll talk about these more later, but they are just serial terminal programs, and they allow the test script to communicate with these two hardware boards. So the Nucleo board represents the product, and this is known more generically as the device under test, or DUT. And the blue pill board is the hardware in the loop simulation hardware. Its job is to simulate external hardware, and in this case, just a GPIO. Finally, I want to point out these XML files. These are created by the test script and they contain the results of the test. They are in a defined format called JUnit XML. Jenkins supports this format and it can display the results of the testing on its GUI. Here I show in detail the connections between the hardware. So starting on the left, we have this laptop with a number of USB connections. For the blue pill board, which is our HIL simulation hardware, we have USB adapters for the serial link and the ST-Link debug interface. As I note here, we don't need this ST-Link uh, interface for CI-CD operation because we don't need to program this board in the pipeline. It's just a piece of test equipment. For the Nucleo board, which is our device under test, we have the USB cable for ST-Link. So as you know, the Nucleo board has a ST-Link adapter built into it. This provides the serial link as well as the debug interface that allows us to program the board. Between the boards, we have a GPIO connection on port B, pin 9, and then we need to tie the grounds together. We also have a loopback connection uh, on GPIO on the uh, product or the device under test. This loop around connection allows some testing even when we don't have the blue pill board. Now on the far right is just a picture of my setup. At the top is the uh, USB to ST-Link adapter. 
It's a cheap one I bought uh, from Amazon, I think. I have it connected to my laptop using a USB extender cord. Now it's hard to see, but the uh, USB to serial adapter cable is uh, also here. And just uh, want to mention, it's important that it is a adapter for 3.3 volt signals. So in the middle here is the blue pill board, and at the bottom is the nucleo board. So that's it. I have mentioned several times that we will be testing the nucleo board, but never describe the application. I originally was using software from one of my past embedded classes, which worked fine, but it occurred to me that unless you knew that software in some detail, the test wouldn't be that meaningful. So I created an application that simply allows the user to read and write GPIO pins via uh, serial console commands. It's maybe not very realistic as a real application, but it's easy to understand. So it supports these formats, and this is the syntax of the commands. You can configure a port pin, read a port pin, uh, write a port pin, reset the board, and get the uh, software version. That's it. We'll briefly look at the software, and I want to say up front, uh, I'm not that happy about it. I wrote it to be easy to understand. It's a super loop, but it has extensive use of blocking, and that's not a good super loop design in my view. Also, to make the software easier to port to other STM32 MCUs that you might want to do, I use the STM32 HAL UART library. Frankly, it is hard to write a good console with this library, and the code is a little ugly, but it works. Now, a bonus of this application is I can also use it on the uh, HIL simulation hardware that runs on the blue pill. Now, it's sort of weird running the same software in both the product and the uh, simulation hardware. Uh, in fact, the application really seems more like a test device than a real product, but of course, this is just for a demo and, and that's fine. Now, for the test script, I used Python because that's my favorite language after C and C++. The test script basically just sends commands to the two boards over the serial links and waits for the expected responses. So it might set a GPIO pin on one board and read the corresponding GPIO pin on the other board and make sure it has the expected value. Now Python has a pexpect module for this kind of stimulus response testing. It's based on the popular uh, expect tool that I used back in the 1990s. The P-Link serial program, or serial terminal program, which comes with PuTTY, is used um, by the test script to connect to the boards. And the um, Python test script records the results in JUnit.xml format that we just talked about. This is made easy by the Python JUnit underscore XML module. As we'll see in the final uh, course demo, Jenkins can read these files and display them. I want to very briefly look at the application code and the Python test code. Of course, if you're interested, you can look at the code in more detail on your own. So here we are in the application code in the file app slash gpio app slash app main dot c. It has a simple super loop for command processor, which I'll show you. So here is the main function. Here is the loop. And the loop basically consists of getting a command line, parsing that command line into tokens, and then processing the command. Now, there's a fair amount of string processing code in this file, but most of it I just copied from previous courses. I want to uh, show you one more thing, and that is the processing of the read and write uh, commands for reading and writing uh, pins. And so the read just uses the HAL GPIO read pin API, and the write uses the HAL GPIO write pin API. It's pretty simple. By the way, porting this code to other STM32 MCUs shouldn't be too hard since I use the uh, HAL library, 
This code already supports four boards. If you want to port it, I would start by looking at config.h. Here is the Python test script. It is under CICD tools and is called base-hilt.py. A lot of you might not know Python, so I'm just going to show a few things at a high level to give you a feel. So the first test is, uh, this is controlled by this function, and it's just checking for a console prompt. It basically sends a line here, an empty line, and this function is checking to see if it's gotten a uh, prompt. And if it hasn't, it means there's something really wrong with the, the software. Uh, and so that's why it's done first. Now I had mentioned the importance of checking the version. So uh, an input parameter to this Python script is a version uh, string. It gets passed in from the Jenkins pipeline, as we'll see later. And that version string gets passed to this function as tver. So this function sends the version command here to the board, and then it expects to get version equals and then tver. If it doesn't get that, we're testing the wrong version and the test fails. So now there are a number of GPIO tests I'd like to show you. Let's go there. So uh, like you often do in software when there's a lot of uh, repetition, I have made these tests sort of data-driven. And that means that we have data structures um, that describe a test as a series of steps. And so for each step, there is the device that you are going to talk to, which can either be the DUT or the SIM, the command you want to send, and then the response you expect. So for this test, uh, we are doing a configuration of a pin on the DUT. We are configuring a pin on the uh, SIM, and these, are the, these two pins are connected to each other. And then on the DUT, we write a value of one, and then on the SIM, we read that pin and we expect to get one. And again, then we write a value of zero and we read and expect to get a value of zero. So if everything works and we always get the expected values, we know that the product is working uh, as designed. So uh, these are simple tests, but hopefully they give you some idea. I want to demo the hardware in the loop test software. So we are in a command window here in the project in the CICD uh, tools folder where the script resides. I have the hardware hooked up, so we just need to run the test script. Now there are various command line options like the COM ports to use, but the default values are correct for my setup. I will just add uh, one command line parameter. Here's the script. I'll add a command line parameter uh, to turn lo uh, logging on to debug. And then this parameter, tver, you might remember, is where I set what the uh, software version string should be, and I happen to know it should be this. Um, this little, this Python 3 here is just a tiny script I wrote to ensure that Python 3 is being used, since I also have Python 2.7 on my laptop. Uh, you might not need to do this. So let me run this script, and there it goes, printing out debug log, and it shouldn't take too much longer. So at the end, it writes those junit.xml files, or I think just one file, um, but it also echoes the contents of that file out to the uh, screen. So we can see what those files look like, and basically it lists all of the test, and uh, there's no information here, so uh, by implication they passed. It also prints this little summary that it did 19 tests, uh, zero were disabled, zero errors, and zero uh, failures. So that's all good. And I would just like to scroll up and look at some of this. Uh, here's a good example of the logging. And basically what this logging is telling us is what it's sending 
and what it's expecting. So it's sending stuff out to the DUT and to the uh, sim, the simulation hardware. So now what I'd like to do is repeat the test, but I'm going to remove a GPIO jumper that'll cause some failures, and I'm also going to put in the wrong uh, software version number. So I'm going to pause the recording uh, while I remove the jumper. So the jumper has been removed. Down here I have uh, got the command set up and I'm just going to add XXX to the software version number to force a failure. And let's start that. And this test is going to take a little bit longer to run because when it doesn't get what it expects it takes a few seconds to time out. I'm going to pause it while it runs. Pause the video recording that is. Okay, so the test has finished, and this time we see some errors. First in the summary, uh, we still ran 19 tests, but there were five failures. And then you can see that for some of the tests, for instance, the version test, there is a failure here listed, and the, the failure is basically saying it didn't get the pattern it expected. And then the same goes for, it looks like for four, the GPIO test failed, because they didn't get the pattern they expected. So that's it for our demo. Here are the prompts for this lesson. I'll pause just a second and then go through them one by one. If your product has no serial console or you didn't want to use a serial console, could you still do hardware in the loop testing? Well, the answer is you certainly could. And the example in this course is sort of an ideal case. It's quite simplified. So the details of how you would do it depend on the type of I.O. your product has, but generally you might make more use of the HAL simulation hardware to simulate external hardware, like sensors and user interfaces. If your product uses the network, for example it's IoT, then you could uh, maybe simulate the cloud server as well, and this would all be under control of the test script. And as I've said several times, keep in mind you can always start um, hardware in the loop testing as part of a CI-CD pipeline uh, very simply. How would you control DUT, device under test, sensor readings such as pressure or temperature sensors? Well, this can be difficult and of course it depends on the technical details of the device under test and the sensors. Uh, possibilities include, one, the ideal thing is if you can electrically uh, simulate the sensor to give different readings, uh, for instance if the sensor uh, provides different uh, voltages. Uh, another possibility, if, that, if you can't do anything uh, physically, is to provide a, some test console commands on the device under test that allow you to override the sensor readings at a low level in the software. Now, this is not pure black box testing, and it's not complete coverage, but it can still add a lot of value. Perhaps you would only do this on the debug build. So, this is a legitimate reason why people often stay away from uh, hardware in the loop, because it's, it has some difficulties. But in my view, the tests don't have to be 100% black box to be uh, useful. If you're doing a build and static code analysis, um, also known as lint, detects problems, but the code compiles and all the automated tests passed, uh, should the build be delivered? What are the pros and cons of delivering that build? Well, the pros would be that static code analysis problems are sometimes minor coding issues, not big deals. And if someone is waiting for that load, for example, let's say it contains a bug fix and they're eager to try it out, uh, just let them have it as soon as possible. The cons would be, well, that problem or the problems detected by the uh, static code analysis could result in some subtle problem not detected by the automated test and anyone using that build could be wasting their time with it. Another uh, con is that sometimes uh, we just want to be strict. We don't want to get into the habit of ignoring static code anal analysis reports. And we sort of say we got to fix those issues um, before we deliver a build. 
In this lesson, the hardware and the loop test were run from the build server laptop. How might you design a system that ran the test from a different server? Well, there's many ways of doing this. Um, what I would think of is having a hardware in the loop script running on the build server to communicate with the test server, and I'm thinking this is another physical machine, maybe it's sitting in a lab somewhere, to initiate the test and get the result. So that test server might provide a simple REST API to allow the build server script to initiate the test and get the results. So the build server uh, HLI script might be able to use a simple tool like curl for the communications. So let's briefly summarize this lesson. We looked at static code analysis as a simple method to check for coding issues and a good component of a CI-CD pipeline. We looked at a simple example of a hardware in the loop test that is driven by a Python script running on the build machine. We saw use of a hardware in the loop simulation hardware board that allowed us to control and monitor GPIO on the device under test. And we saw use of the JUnit XML format as a way to record test results and communicate them to Jenkins. Well, that's it for this lesson on static code analysis and hardware in the loop testing. Thanks for watching.